So this morning, yes, Jane, go ahead. You have oh, a question? Just said good morning. Oh, Sorry. good morning. I was saying already a question. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this morning, we're going to talk about Parshas Toldos, the birth of the, who knows? Whose birth? Anybody remember? The birth of the twins. The twins are Jacob yes. and Esau. Who was older? Anybody remember? Uh, Esau. 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 Esau was Esau. older. And I want to open up with the words of what happens when Rivka, the wife of Yitzchak, becomes pregnant with the twins. But before we open up with what happens... I want to repeat a very interesting theme that we've been discussing, and that is Misa of Isimila Banim. That whatever happens with the matriarchs and the patriarchs pave the way for all generations. Their challenges, their tribulations, their, their problems, and how they conquered and overcame and their self sacrifice paved our bridges, our uh, tunnels, our walkways through the jungle, metaphorically speaking. And what they did is not only that they did it for their time, but for all generations, our level of self-sacrifice, our level of commitment, our, our the miracles that happened to us is all because of what the matriarchs and patriarchs did. So if you look at it, the history is a very interesting thing. Sarah, She's nine years old, was not able to conceive a child. Remember? Mm -hmm. That's why she gives hugger to her husband, Abraham, right? She says, you have to have children. Now let's go to the next person, Rivka. She wasn't able to conceive for a while. And then next Torah portion, as we move forward, the story of Rachel and Jacob. Rachel couldn't have children. Her sister was having children every every day, whatever, every year. And she <laughs> finally gave birth to Joseph and then Benjamin and passes away in childbirth. So why is it that the matriarchs, the foundation of our lives, the foundation of Judaism, the foundation of Jewish life, always had a problem having children? What do you think? And they had to rely on a miracle because nobody just had it simply. They had to rely on God's blessings, a miracle. Based on what we just said, does anybody have an insight? Maybe to make more emphasis on that birth is a miracle. Excellent. Excellent. To show us, and I'll build on your point, Carrie, that the matriarchs and the patriarchs did not, those who struggled with having a child, Leah obviously didn't, but the other three did. Sarah struggled, Rivka struggled, and Rachel struggled to have ch children. That's why they don't have 11, 12 children. Each one of them, Rivka twins, Sarah one, and Rachel two. But what children they had, wow. Because, to sh again, paving the way for future generations. They had to rely on God's blessing, on a miracle. And that's how we have to look at life. That every day we rely on God's blessing. Even when you think, oh, it came so easily to me. This was no miracle. It came anyway. I worked hard and I got it. To teach us that everything in life is really a miracle. And we have to rely on miracles. And we have to ask for miracles. And we have to ask for God's blessing. Even when we think it's coming naturally to us, know that even in nature, it's a miracle. And more so, God was showing us that the matriarchs and patriarchs relied on a miracle to have children. So that opening the door for miracles to happen to us every day of our lives. Again, paving the way for the energy of miracles to happen in our lives. There was an atheist and he was in the woods hiking and suddenly a bear comes running to attack him. So he calls out, God, help me. So God says, now you're a believer? Now you believe in me when you need my help? He says, you know, actually, God, I changed my mind. Could you make the bear a believer? So God said, sure. 
second later, he hears the beer calling out, Baruch Atah Hashem Alekeinu Melech Alam Shahakal Nia Bidvarai, the blessing before eating. <laughs> and then the beer attacked. <laughs> so you want miracles to happen in your life, you have to believe in miracles. You have to believe that life is truly miraculous. Like uh, I had a story this week. So I, the guy, I said to the guy, he said it was a miracle. I said, I know. I always depend on miracles. There's no other way. <laughs> so this Torah portion now opens up with Rivka is pregnant with twins. And I want to read it to you. What happens? She's pregnant and she's having a difficult pregnancy. She's in pain. Let me open up. And the children crushed within her. And she said, why is it that I'm in pain? And she went to ask God. Good morning, Dorita. And God says to her, two nations are in your womb. And two regimes from your inside shall be separated. And one regime shall become strong and the elder shall serve the younger. Okay? So she finds out from God that she's having twins. That's why she's in so much pain. And now Rashi jumps in and says something unbelievable. That whenever Rivka passed a Jewish house of worship, a shul, a yeshiva, maybe our shul, Jacob struggled to get out. And whenever Esau passed a house of idolatry, she passed a house of idolatry when she was taking a walk or a hike or going shopping. She passed a house of ill repute or idolatry. Esau struggled to get out. This is what Rashi says. Okay, now let me ask you a question. Based on this Rashi, can you blame Esau for becoming who he is? A hunter, a kidnapper, an abuser of women. It says in Rashi that even when he was in the womb, he was already gravitating towards idolatry, ill repute. So do we have free choice? Based on, on this Rashi, Esau was already going towards the path of idolatry. And Jacob, who well, you already know, is a Talmud Chacham, a scholar. He's already running to go to Yeshiva even when he's in the womb so to speak. So I'm going to ask you a question. Do we have free choice based on this uh, Rashi? It seems like our lives are predestined. You're predestined to have blue eyes like your dad, and you're predestined to have a mean streak like your mother or your father. So it's not my fault. My mother was mean. My grandmother was mean. My great-grandmother was mean, and I'm mean. Why are you blaming me? Everybody in my family was mean. Are we predestined? to be a certain way. That's my question to you. Okay, Dorita, what, what do you say? Let's hear. No, because each generation faces a different set of circumstances. Okay. And a different culture and a different society. So you can't say because 200 years ago, they were mean, I can be mean. It doesn't fit. Okay, good. I like your answer. Who else? Do we have free choice is the question. Dorita says, no, you have a way. You can change yourself. You can't maybe change your eye color. Maybe you could with contact lenses. But anybody else want to offer anything? Arena, you have anything you want to add? Margaret, Jane. Well, I think we if we see that there's a pattern, everyone is mean in our family, we should just break this pattern and become better people. And this way we can change our future generation. Very good. Exactly. Very good. I so think most, most people that grow up in a house where they're, they're mean, it's very few percentage of people that actually have the wherewithal to say, I'm not going to be this way. So I'm very good. Different. So I see that everyone is on the right track here. That, that we have the ability to even kind of say, change our destiny or change our DNA and change a characteristic or behavior. But Hasidus Kabbalah goes even deeper. 
I love this. God created every human being with talents, attributes, strengths, weaknesses, and challenges. For example, some people are lily thin. They have no desire to eat a giant piece of cake and never stop. It's not them. They have other problems. So everybody has different things that challenge them. What challenges you may not challenge me. Like one lady said, I can never get through a book. I can't even read five pages. And another person can read 10 books a week. So we each are given challenges along with our talents and fine characteristics. We're also given certain traits that either we inherit from family or we're taught at home or we learn in school. And just because you have a desire to do something like the Torah will say not to do, doesn't mean you have to act on that desire. I have many desires. I desire a million dollars, I'll rob a bank. You're not allowed to steal. So that's point one, that not always because you have a challenge or a desire that another person may not have, you act upon it. You have free choice to give in or not to give in to that desire. You're happily married, or rather you can't, you're married and you desire another partner in your life. So what? You could desire from today to date, but you do not act upon it. You're a married person. You stay loyal to your partner, to your spouse. Now let's go even deeper. What Rashi is saying, something spectacular. That Esau, the soul of Esau came from a very, very high place. Remember we discussed why the kingdom of the Jews comes from the incestuous relationship of Lot and later on the, the, the tumultuous relationship of Ruth and Boaz. Why couldn't the king fr come from lily white, pure, pure lineage? Why did it have to be so much controversy? Because the higher the spark, the greater the light, the more opposition there is to it. Sometimes you speak to a person and the guy is the most outstanding human being and you say to them, wow, you must have had amazing parents and the person will say to you, no, I actually came from very simple parents. Who you see now is not who I was, for example, or who you expected me to be. Sometimes the greatest light comes into a person and the constant negative energy, or I don't want to call it the evil inclination, or the, the negativity in, put in the universe fights the light and challenges that person constantly. Esau was supposed to be the leader of the Jewish people. He had a tremendous energy and light. And the negative energy, the evil inclination knew that and attacked and attacked. And Esau choose, chose the wrong path. So yes, because he was so powerful already in the womb, there was an opposition to that power. There was an opposition to that light, says the Kabbalah. Because where does a challenge come? The negative, the Eitzahara, the evil inclination doesn't come to somebody who they know won't eat, for example, non-kosher. They're not going to come to somebody and say, here's a ham sandwich, look how delicious it is. It's going to go to someone who's weak, as a weak link. When the, and also, who's the Yetzirah want to challenge? Someone where there's a tremendous light. Not somebody who has no light. The negative energy in the universe challenges those with tremendous power, tremendous light to get them to fall. So Esau was born with such a light, such an energy greater even than Yaakov, than his younger brother. And that's why he was already had that challenge to go towards idolatry, to kidnap women. He had a very strong evil inclination because he had a very strong light. And his challenge was to not give in, but he does give in. So just to sum up, because it's a kind of a complicated concept, is the greater the light, the greater the challenge. The negative energy that Yetzirah doesn't challenge someone who has no light or doesn't have the ability to bring great light into the world. The negative 
energy in the universe challenges of the year where you could have tremendous light. It wants to tear it down, take it down, counteract it. That's its job. So when Aso is about to be born and he's in his mother's womb and that energy, that light is supposed to be born, the negative energy, the Yetzirah already pushes him towards the house of idolatry, towards the house of ill repute. Now when he's born and he's growing into adulthood, he gives in to this evil inclination. He doesn't say, you know, I'm the son of Yitzhak and Rivka. I have a destiny to follow in the way of my grandfather, Abraham and Sarah. I'm not going to give in to that darkness. I'm going to use my energy for light. He doesn't do that. So basically to sum up, is Rashi saying everybody has challenges based on their talents. Everybody has is challenged based on their abilities. And if God gives you a challenge, you can bet your bottom dollar you can handle it. Otherwise, God wouldn't give it to you. The question is, will you walk to this path, the righteous path, or will you go to the not righteous path? So Asav had a tremendous energy. He was destined to be the next king of the Jewish people and a conqueror of darkness, a conqueror of evil. Instead, he became part of the problem. He fell into the darkness. He, was, he worshiped idolatry, as we'll soon see. He's a hunter. He's a killer. He kidnaps women and he takes them for his own. And that's who Esau is. And he gives because he gives in to the negative energy, the evil inclination. He falls into the darkness instead of overpowering the darkness and creating light. So is this concept clear what Rashi is saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. So interesting that the, uh, the Torah portion is, talks about the birth of the twins. Asav is called Asav because it comes from the word ready-made. He comes out, head full of hair, mouth full of teeth, he's ready to roll. Again, indicating that he had a tremendous light and a tremendous energy. He came into the world ready ready with a certain tremendous talent to conquer. But he didn't do that. He didn't use that energy. Again, he goes, he, he uses it for darkness. And who's holding on to his foot? Anybody knows? To the heel. His brother. His brother. And what do they call, what, is, what do they call the brother? His Hebrew name? Yaakov. Yaakov, Yaakov. which means heel. So now I want to digress, and then I'm going to, I want to share something really beautiful. I want to digress into Jewish names. So Esau is called Esau because he comes out, Asa, he's ready-made. Yaakov is called Heel. How many of you would name your child Heel? <laughs> Raise your hand. Would you call you? Oh, he was holding on to his brother's Heel. Let me call him Heel. Hi, Heel. Hi, Heel. <laughs> Isn't that denigrating? Okay. Uh, now yeah. let's go back. Who's who's ya Yaakov and Esau's father? Yitzchak, Isaac, right? right? The great Isaac. Why is he called Yitzchak? Why do his parents, Abraham and Sarah, call him Yitzchak? Remember what happens when God tells Sarah you're having a child? What does she do? She laughs. Oh, uh, means to laugh? Means to laugh. So what do they call their son laughter? How many of you would call your son laughter? Let's to laugh. Laughter before heal. Exactly. I would rather call my son. Actually, I love the name Yitzchak. But he, and Yaakov, I actually have a son, Yaakov. I also did made this. I'm making a joke. I made the same mistake. No, I didn't. It's a beautiful name, and I'll explain why in a minute. So before I explain this, what are these names all about? I want to ask you what your Hebrew name is and why you were named that. And I remember many years I was in, uh, when I first moved here, the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe spoke about how important it is to use your Jewish Hebrew name. So there was a lady, her name was Bonnie. And I meet her on the street. And for hundreds of years, I called her Bonnie. I go, hi, Bonnie. No, my name is Brian Ashena. And every time I saw her, I would forget and call her Bonnie. And she says, no, my name is Brian Ashena. She would always interrupt me because the Rebbe said, use your Hebrew name. Anyway, Carrie, what's your Hebrew name? Ana Ahuba. 
and I was named Hannah yeah. Ahuva. I was named from my my great grandmother who uh, was killed in the Holocaust. As a matter of fact, I have I actually have her picture. Okay. Yeah, I do. I don't know if you could see it. See her? Yeah. Beautiful. Her. Wow. And, what an honor and, you have. And my and her and her husband who made it over here. But oh, that, we can't that's, see it. That's, no, the oh. camera. I'll raise the picture. Nope, the other way. <laughs> uh, this way? Down or up? Down, down. Mo, 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 mo. Oh my God. Wow. They all wore a side part. Did you notice? My grandmother also. Yeah, what's up, <laughs> with, that? Had, what's up with that? I don't know. She had a side part in her shaitel. Anyway, in her way. Anyway, so, so, so I'm fortunate yes. enough. My mother gave me that, those two photos of my great grandparents. But yes, she was, she was killed in the Holocaust. She went to Auschwitz. A, a tribute to your grandmother. Oh, Ahuva means love. Chana is, the, is a beautiful name. I'll explain what that is in a minute. Okay, Jane, your Hebrew name. Yehudit Yochebed. Beautiful. And Who are you named after? Uh, my great grandmother. And I guess the, her family got here earlier. They were here, I guess, running from the Cossacks before the, you know, earlier in the century. So Yechebed is a Jewish heroine, mother of <laughs> Moses. Yehudit is the famous Judith in the story of Hanukkah. Remember, she kills the, the king. I mean, the uh, general chops off his head. She's very heroic. Very nice name. Devora, De Rita, you're Devora? Yeah. Who are you named after? I'm uh, uh, my father's grandmother. And my father named me Devora because his grandmother was very <laughs> knowledgeable and always made, came to conclusions that made the family be together. And I feel like all my life, I was that judge, <laughs> Devora. Devora the prophetess, she was a yeah. judge. Yeah. Margaret. I, I was never given a Jewish name, although I know I was named, uh, my Margaret was named after my grandma Molly, but I didn't, was never given a name. So what are you going to choose as your Jewish name, well, Margaret? I like Margalit. <laughs> beautiful, Margalit, very beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, they say a Jewish name is given by prophecy to the parents. Mm -hmm. But if your parents didn't have the prophecy, you have the prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> Arita, what about you? What is your Hebrew name? My name is almost the same. It just doesn't have A ending. It's like Irene. It's like it derives from Aaron. Beautiful. Aaron, the, the first high priest. That's a beautiful name. I have Shalom, but I have Shalom. He was a man of peace and pursued peace for everyone else. It's a beautiful name. A beautiful name, Irina. Beautiful. My name is Freda. <laughs> um, in Yiddish, it means happiness and joy. I'm named after my grandmother, Freda. Mm -hmm. who was in Russia, and they had to run away from communist Russia, and they ended up in Toronto with fake passports. And uh, they, uh, my, grandparent, my, grand, my grandfather, Simon, was tortured in prison for six years because he was a emissary of the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe to spread Judaism in Russia. So they found him after six years, and they put him into prison, and they fi he finally escaped with my grandmother and my father, and my uncle and my other uncle, my third uncle, was born in a DP camp. And when they escaped in Germany. Anyway, more about my grandparents another time. But we all here shared our beautiful names. So what's the story of Yaakov being called heel, Yitzhak being called laughter? And remember, their names were given by prophecy. God wanted these names. Now, remember, I want to go off on a teeny tangent. Yaakov's name is later changed to Yisrael, right? Yeah. The house of Israel is Yaakov. So Yaakov has two names, Yaakov and Yisrael. So Yisrael is a beautiful name. Yaakov is healed. You know why Yaakov is healed? The Kabbalah says something. I love this. What's the first letter of Yaakov? Yud. 
What's Yud? God's name. Akev, last three letters, is heal. By the way, Akev also means other things. But for now, we're talking about heal. When God puts us into this universe, Yaakov's name defines what the mission, our mission, your mission, my mission in this world. Many times we say, God is for the synagogue. God is for the rabbi. God is for the rabbitson. God is when I want Yom Kippur. God is Rosh Hashanah. The rest of the time, God is not part of my life. God has nothing to do with the stock market. God has nothing to do with me shopping. God has nothing to do with my job as a, as a, as a broker. God is not in my daily life. God is for the holy moments. When I want to pray, that's where God is. But Akev, Yud, God's name, Akev, heal, is telling us that God is even in the heel of a foot. God permeates 24-7 every part of our lives. As a matter of fact, our mission is not to sit in the synagogue all day praying in a holy book and swaying and praying. Our mission is to go into the world, go into the heels of the universe, and bring godliness, the youth, into Akev. Godliness into the heel. Godliness into the most mundane, materialistic, simple things in life. Everything has to be imbued with godliness, used for godliness, elevated. Like money. Money is the most mundane, materialistic, self-centered thing you could think of, right? It's the cause for most of crimes. <laughs> money. We love money. We need money. But when you take money and you give tzedakah, you take money and you buy food, kosher food to give you strength. You take money, you clothe your family and you set up a beautiful Shabbos table. Now the money, which is the most mundane heal, is now holy. It imbues it with holiness. That's what the name Yaakov, Yaakov, who is the father of the 12 tribes, his name tells us what, why we're here. We're here because we have to take the Akev, the heel, and put the Yud, God, into it. Um, yes, go ahead. Um, it's funny. We also use the word heel like when we're training a dog for the dog to follow us. So right. I wonder if there's any, you know, thing about that. But, of course, we're not supposed to follow Yaakov. So, no, we're supposed I to mean, follow Yaakov. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I said, uh, um, I, okay, it flew out of my mind. I wanted to say what else Akov means, but I'll come to me in a minute. Uh, somehow my thought process uh, swayed to the side. So, here we see the beauty of Yaakov's name. And then when he wrestles with the angel of Esau, he gets called Yisrael. Now he becomes the. Uh, the leader of the Jewish people. Israel has the word leadership of the Jewish people. And it also contains the names of the matriarchs and patriarchs. If you look at the word Yisrael, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Leah, Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov. Isn't that beautiful? In the Hebrew word Yisrael, you have the mothers and the fathers of the Jewish people. Because again, they're the foundation of the Jewish people. Now I just want to share Yitzchak's name because it's really beautiful in regard to relationships. And then we're going to go to something really spectacular. So when Yitzchak was born, they named him Laughter, Joy. Because joy and laughter. Remember I discussed with you how Judaism is not about sadness. Telling your children, a million people, a million died in the Holocaust. You got to remember that. It's very important to teach our children about the tragedies, holocausts, crusaders, anti-Semitism, and all the miserable stories in our lives. But people have to be raised with joy, with laughter, with happiness. Children can't, don't, cannot be raised with the Holocaust curriculum only. You have to show them the beauty of Judaism, the joy of Judaism. Otherwise, why do I want, why do I want to be Jewish, a kid thinks to himself. I don't want to be part of the persecuted people, the miserable people, 
the unhappy people. I want to be part of the joyous nations. But if you raise children with joy in Judaism, of course, never, never forgetting the tragedies in our lives. We're not ignoring, God forbid. You have to tell your children how we were persecuted, attacked, killed during our history. It's very important, but not that the whole foundation of your home is remember what happened. Like, which kid likes when the mother says, oh, you didn't finish your food? They're starving in India. They're starving in Afghanistan. When I was a kid, we starved. Who wants to hear that? Once in a while, you tell your children, <laughs> but not every day. They're going to grow up saying, I, yeah, that again? <laughs> They're going to want to distance themselves from you. So Yitzhak defines, again, joy and laughter in Judaism. But now let, we have to go a little deeper based on Hasidic Jewish mysticism, that every relationship has to be based on laughter. Our relationship with our spouses, our relationship with God, our relationship with our parents, our children, because what is laughter? Now I want to ask you, what is truly, what is laughter? When do you laugh? When do you laugh? Arena, when do you laugh? Oh, when I'm happy. And you're happy. When else? Oh. When I hear a funny story. Exactly. I, I don't hear? know when my kids, uh, when I laugh, when my kids are happy, when my kids uh, fulfilled whatever they had to fulfill. I'm smiling constantly, but that's when I'm happy <laughs> and I laugh. I'm like, Good. finally, they did it. Finally. That's when I'm laughing, actually. Good. That's beautiful. So Carrie says when you hear a funny story, why do you laugh after a funny story? Because what? Because... It's how it's told. It's some people are just good storytellers and it's even funnier when they say it. Yeah, like my father used to tell great jokes. The problem was he didn't know the punchline. He always <laughs> forgot the punchline. So we would lean in and like, ah. And he says, I forgot. Go ahead. We're all laughing now. You're talking and you're <laughs> yeah. laughing and we're laughing. Laughter releases emotional energy. Beautiful. Yeah. Yep. You know, when you do a telethon, they tell you smile when you make the appeal because people can hear, feel your smile through the phone. Anyway, so there's a guy at a bris. He gave birth to a baby boy and he's at the circumcision and the moil is about to do the circumcision and the rabbi whispers into the father's ear. Now we have to give the Jewish name, the Hebrew name. What's the baby's name? Father looks at the rabbi in the mile. I forgot. I forgot the name I wanted to give. So the rabbi says to the mile, and Shmai be Israel, Abraham, the name of the baby will be Abraham. And they named the baby Abraham. Father, during the meal, during the celebration, says the rabbi, he's so smart. I just remembered that's the name I wanted to give. How did you know? How did you guess? He says, I'll tell you how I guessed. I saw you standing there like Abraham's father, who was Terach. Terach was an idolater, remember? When I saw that the father of the baby is like a Terach, I knew the baby had to be Abraham. <laughs> Terach <laughs> indicating like a guy who was like... <laughs> To know if he's coming or going. So when I saw you were like the Tarach, I knew your baby needed to be Avram. He said. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so laughter. Why do you laugh at a punchline of a joke? Because it's unexpected. You don't know what to expect. You laugh. Now, when your baby grabs your pocketbook, puts on lipstick, puts on your high heels, and comes waddling into the kitchen or the dining room, and all the guests laugh. Oh, look how cute. She is. You laugh because look how it's unexpected. A little two-year-old putting on mommy's lipstick pocketbook and, 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 and high heels and waddling into the kitchen is hysterical. Now imagine if you did that, who would laugh at you? They'd say, wow, she's crazy. She's ridiculous. <laughs> so laughter is the unexpected. When your child does something unexpected, everybody laughs. Wow, look how cute. So laughter equal unexpected. That's the secret ingredient in relationships. Normally, a man and a woman, husband and wife, 
really, how could two people from so diametric opposites get together and get married and have a relationship? He's from the moon. She's from the moon. He's from Mars or she's from Venice. He's from Mars. He's like this. She's like that. Like, come on. You couldn't put two equal opposites together. Mm. But when one, an unexpected occurrence happens, where two opposites come together and create a marriage or a relationship together, that's laughter. It's the unexpected. When a person who's, put, and I'm going to develop the point, when a person is put down into this universe in a materialistic body and the soul forgets, the body forgets that it has a soul and it wanders into the world and it, and it has a job and it accumulates money and materialism. And suddenly the body remembers that there's a soul and you have to do a goodness in the world and recognize godliness and take the mundane and bring light into it. That's called laughter, the unexpected. So when God sees the laughter, the unexpected in life, in relationships, that's the foundation of the world. Laughter, the unexpected. The unexpected is when there's a body and it does something godly. Why would a body do something godly? Why would a body like Shabbos candles, eat kosher food, celebrate Shabbos, give tzedakah? The body is materialistic. So when the body remembers its soul and together they do something unexpectedly good, God laughs and says, wow, that's exactly why they're there. Is, is that where that saying man plans and God laughs? <laughs> Not a, perhaps. So maybe that's when, when a person makes plans and then something else happens, divine properties. So Hasidic Jewish mysticism says the secret to a successful relationship is the laughter. It's the unexpected. The unexpected is when a person is self-centered. It's me, me, me. And now they make room for their spouse, their wife, their husband, or they make room for God in the, in the, in the universe. That's laughter. It's the unexpected. Our nature is to be egotistical, self-centered. Think about myself, me, me, me. When you now take the me and make a we, whether it's a husband or God in your life, that's laughter. The unexpected. So when the unexpected happens, that's laughter. That's why so, you laugh. So, let me ask you a question, yes. Freda. So um, beshert, when you say somebody is my beshert, how does that work in with what you're saying? So I'm talking about building a relationship how laughter equals the unexpected and the unexpected is what's needed in a relationship because okay. what's said, but Dasher is mean your soulmate. Dasher means before the beginning of time, there was a soul up in the heavens. We're using heavens as a metaphor. And now God took the male energy and the female energy and that one soul and split it down the middle and put those souls into two separate bodies, a boy and a girl. Mazel tov. And the souls go through life, but each one is a half. And when you meet your soulmate, you meet your basharit, and you stand under the chuppah, and the guy puts the ring on the girl's finger and gives the ksuba, and, she's, and he says, what happens is that suddenly the two souls become one again. You're now you're reunited with your soul. That's the cause of sexual attraction. We're always looking for our other half. That's why boys run after girls and girls run after boys, because we're always running to find our soulmate. And it starts quite young. <laughs> that's, the, that's the source of attraction. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's a gift. Intimacy between husband and wife who have been married by the chuppah is the holiest mitzvah in the Torah. Did you know that? I want to ask a different class. What's the most important mitzvah in the universe? One said kosher, Shabbos, tzedakah. No. Intimacy with your husband who you've married under a chuppah. Why? That is two souls becoming one. you reunited. That's the greatest mitzvah. Again, joy, it brings joy. And joy is the secret of this universe. 
That's why we go to mikvah before we have intimacy, after we have our cycle. Because for that great mitzvah, there's a preparation. That's what it is. That's what it really is. So now you understand a little bit about why Yitzhak is called laughter. Yaakov is called heal. <laughs> because they are defining who we are, their children and their great-grandchildren. So now let's read what happens in the story. Okay, you have two beautiful twins. Vayigdalu haneharim. And the young youths grow up. Vayi Asaf ish yoide etzayid. Esau is a what? What's his profession? What does he like to do, everybody? Shepherd. Shepherd? Shepherd. Not quite. Hunter, 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 hunter. 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 He's a hunter. A man of the field. And Yaakov, who knows what Yaakov's profession was? Oh. What do you think? Guess. Oh. He sat. And he was an innocent man, says the Torah, dwelling in tents. So what do you think he is? He's a scholar. He sits in yeshiva. He sits and studies Torah. He gets straight A's on his algebra test. And Esau is the son that every day the principal calls the house. Today, your son was doc. Today, your son was a bully. Today, your son was expelled. Today, your son brought a gun to school. Every day, there's a story with Esau. So there's two types of children in our lives. There's the Yaakov. When do you get a call? When your child is chosen as valedictorian. <laughs> once, in, once in four years. Hello, Mrs. Sklar. Guess what? Your son Yaakov is going to be valid Victorian of Staples High School. Wow. But what did I expect? The kid never gave me a hard day in my life. I'm a chaya. Hey, Sav, every day the phone rings. You say to your husband, it's your turn to talk to the principal. <laughs> it's your turn to talk to the teacher. I'm not taking care of this kid anymore. He's not my kid. He takes after your side of the family. <laughs> <laughs> Ever had that conversation? He's, uh, uh, see, stubborn, he's your child. A bully, he's your child. <laughs> so there's two types of children. There's a child, come on, you never have a pain. And the kid is a gem. Straight A's. They breeze through life. And the other child, every day, there is a headache. So two children, would you believe it? Rivka and Yitra. The matriarchs and patriarchs have two children, an Esav and a Yaakov. And you're like, want to ask, how did this happen? How did this happen? Think about it. This is one of the questions I want to ask you. How is it possible that a Yitzhak and a Rivka have an Esav? Okay, now, next thing, what happens? Listen, this is now the plot thickens. And the, Chum, the Torah says this. And if it's in the Torah, it's there for us. Vayahav Yitzchak is Esau. And Yitzchak loved Esau. Esau. Why? Kitzayid Bepiv. Because game was in his mouth. I'll explain that in a minute. The Rivko Hevis is Yaakov. And Rivko loves Yaakov. Now let me ask a question. Based on this passage, what does it seem like? Who loved whom? Uh, Rivka loved uh, Yaakov. And Esau's father loved him. So Yitzhak in the Torah says loved Esau. He didn't love Yaakov? And Rivka loved Yaakov, didn't love Esau? A mother and father don't love both children? What? Hello? No, they somehow identified the, more with one or the other. Right. Okay, very good. So the Torah might be saying, it's not that they didn't love both, it's just sometimes you have an affinity. She's just like me. Mm -hmm. She's the one I go out with coffee because she just like, we get along great. The other daughter, everything is a headache. She sits and com complains the whole time. So you're saying there might be an affinity. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, I'm, I'm building on your point. Anyone else have an insight? Don't re remember, I don't have all the answers here. <laughs> <laughs> so the Torah is not saying, like Margaret said, that Yaakov doesn't, that Yitzchak doesn't love Yaakov. Of course he loves him. 
And Rivka doesn't love Esav. Of course she adores Esav. She loves her children. It's telling us something else. Yitzchak saw the potential. Yitzchak saw the potential. Rivka saw the reality. This is based on Jewish mysticism. Chassid is Kabbalah. Yitzchak saw that tremendous energy that Isa was born with. Remember we said that Isa was born with such an energy. That's why the evil inclination pushed him harder than Yaakov. Because his light was so great, the evil inclination fought it. Rivka saw the reality that Isa did not fulfill his potential. But her younger son did. Now, interesting tidbit. Remember, Rivka grew up where? In Mesopotamia. With a father who was a Ghanif, a thief and a swindler, and a brother who was a swindler and a Ghanif and worshipped idolatry. The soil and lover. So she, when she, she knew, she knew character, because she grew up with it. Yitzha grew up in the land of Israel with Avram and Sarah. He didn't see viciousness, and evil like his wife. She was exposed to it. She grew up with it. Her neighbors were all immoral, unethical, idol worshippers. She grew up with it. When Yitzchak didn't. So she saw the reality. He saw the potential. That's one explanation. But now there's something which is one of my favorite, favorite things in the Torah. What does it mean he loved him because he was game in his mouth? So the commentary said, very simple. Yesa was a hunter. He hunted the most delectable, delicious meats, and he would bring it to his father. Wow, he would bring him gourmet meats that you can't get in any grocery store. So the commentary say, really? He loved Esau? He was that materialistic because he brought him good game, good food? They say, no. It means something else. He entrapped him with his mouth. Sayyid, he entrapped Yitzchak with his words, with his mouth. How? He would say to his father, Dad, how do you give Tithi? Tithi means tzedakah. You know, you give 10% of your earnings. How do you give Tithi from straw and salt? Wow. Wow. Even from straw and salt, you're going to give tzedakah, you're going to give a percentage. Straw and salt, you don't have to. According to Jewish law, you don't have to give a percentage of your salt manufacturing company <laughs> if it's you manufacture salt or straw. If you have straw, you don't give 10%. You give it from money, you give it from crops, you give it from cattle, but you give straw and salt. So, wow, he entrapped his father by asking, how do I give tzedakah? From straw and salt, wow, my son is, wow, is he generous and kind. So the commentaries say he tricked his father by asking him a halacha question. His father, wow, well, this kid is a good kid. He's even worried about straw and salt. But now Hasidus goes deeper and says, really? Yitzhak didn't know that his son was an immoral, unethical Young man, he didn't know. Yitzhak didn't know his own son. He didn't. Yitzhak was blind, by the way. He was blind in his later latter years. I'm going to explain that in a minute. And the answer is, this is very beautiful. Precisely because he knew his son, he loved him. The Torah says Yitzhak loved Esau because he knew him. Because he knew him, he loved him. What does this mean? What I said before. Who needs the most love? A child that is not going on the right path. A child that has drifted away. A child that's alienated. That a child is promiscuous. A child who's doing things they shouldn't be doing. That's who needs love. The greatest love. The Torah is teaching us it's easy to shower love on a Yaakov. Who do you really need to give even more love to and attention is the Asavs in our lives. There was a great rabbi, Haraf Cook. I'm sure you've heard of him. And a man came to me, says, Rebbe, help me, help me. My son 
was always wonderful. Now he drifted away. He doesn't keep Shabbos. He doesn't eat kosher. He takes drugs. What should I do? Rav Cook said to him, tell me, did you love your son before he went, went away, you know, drifted away? And he said, of course, I loved him deep. He says, now love him even more. Give him even more love, more attention. Love him even more because he needs it. That's what he needs. The Torah is saying, precisely because Asaph was who he was, Yitzhak needed to show him more love, more attention. That's what you do when you have a child, Nebuch, sometimes. Not every child could be perfect, even with perfect parents. That's no guarantee. Children have challenges. Certain children have influences. Children have in their struggles that they're given in their lives by God. Child, love that child even more, the Torah is telling us. That's the child. It's so easy to have a conversation with the easygoing child. The other child, you get on the phone. What do you want? Yeah, that's why you're calling me. You always call me when you need a favor, Ma. What do you want? Bam. Honey, I'm calling you because I miss you. I love you. The child that hangs up on you, the child that slams the door, that intentionally leaves the socks on the floor when you told them 99 times there's a hamper in the corner. <laughs> the child, every time you ask for a favor, can't you ask somebody else? That's the child that needs the most love. The child that gets called into the principal's office every day, that child is calling out for love and attention. Yes. Go ahead, Dory. How, how do you... <clears throat> what good is the extra love if the person does not know what to do with or accept the extra love? That's a very, very good question. So a love is not the end all, all. You can't say love, you know, love makes the world go round. And if that love, sometimes people, by the way, love must be tempered with discipline. You, the, the same loving mother is the same mother that also has to tell a child, no, that's unacceptable behavior. An another problem we have in our world is the parents are afraid to be parents. Mm -hmm. The, the parents all want to be their children's friends. Mm -hmm. Your child is not looking for a friend. Your child wants to know there's a mother figure and father figure in their lives. They're looking for you to say, that's not the right thing to do, or I would do it this way. So that's first of all. But second of all, many times people will reject your love. They can't accept it because they hate themselves so much. They don't know what love is. Who is loving? Someone who, fe who fe loves themselves. Who is unloving someone who can't, doesn't love themselves? <laughs> and again, I'm not a therapist, and it's, it's, we don't have enough time to really delve delve. But us giving love to the, someone who feels unloved is a step in making them feel loved. Because many times you speak to kids who want to take their own life, they don't feel they're worthy of it. They're not worthy of being loved. So how do they show you that, that it's painful? So they act aggressively mean and heartless because inside they'd say to themselves, I don't deserve to be loved. I don't deserve love. I don't deserve goodness. I don't deserve to be in this world. Why was I even born? What purpose do I have in this world? That's the real reason they're rejecting love because they don't feel worthy of love. They don't love themselves so they can accept your love. This is a simple story, but I'll give you a simple, I'll have a look I now, you know, 11 children. And whenever they would go off for the week of school, because they lived by my mother, many of them, I never let them walk out the door without a hug and a kiss. And one daughter would always push me, Ma, I'll stop kissing me. I pushed and pushed. I kissed no matter what that one said. I don't want to kiss. I don't need your kisses. Anyway, one day I, for some reason, didn't notice she was leaving. So I, I was upstairs and suddenly I hear her calling, Ma, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. I'm waiting for your hug. That was the last time she rebuffed my hug. And by the way, that was for a whole year of hugging. So my job was not to say, oh, she doesn't want a hug. I'm not giving her a hug. 
And I'm using this as a metaphor. Yeah. My job as a mother was to give love, love, love. The child rejects it, fine. They have to come terms with why they're rejecting. But for you to abstain because, oh, my kid doesn't need a love. My kid doesn't need a hug. That's not the approach. The approach is you give all the love you can give. So did Asa know that he had extra love from Yaakov? Yes. And there's a beautiful insight that Asa is lauded for honoring his parents. Because whenever he came to his mother and father's house, he would wear hunting clothes. You know, like in the movies, the Vikings, you saw the Vikings, Game of mm -hmm. Thrones. That's how Ace of dressed. But when he came to his parents, he had a beautiful set of furs he wore. The Torah says this. The Torah lords him for honoring his parents. He had a beautiful set of clothes. And because, and look how the food he brought his father and mother every week from his hunting. And soon you'll see, I, I want to really get to the story of the, of the, of the birthright, because it's, again, something unbelievable. Um, I hope you'll allow me another five minutes if you yep. want. Yep. So he, he had a tremendous respect for his mother and father. As a matter of fact, he knew how disappointed they were. The Torah tells us he marries two girls from the Chitis, two girls from the tribe of Chiti. And his parents were so upset because they were their daughter-in-laws were idol worshippers. So he brings them into the family clan and they burnt incense to the idolaters. That's their way of worshiping the idols. And they worship idolatry. And he sees his parents looking like you brought two wives from that tribe, idolaters, and they burnt incense all day to the to their gods. It was very, very upsetting to Rivka and to Yitzchak, by the way. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shorten the story. Remember, uh, uh, so fast forward, Avram passes away. Yitzchak is sitting Shiva. Yaakov is making him a bean meal, you know, lentils. Yitzchak comes back from hunting. He's starving. He says, give me the soup. He says, no, it's for dad. He says, no, 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 I'm starving. He says, so sell me your birthright and I'll give you the soup. He says, what do I need my birthright? And he takes the soup. Okay, fast forward. Now Yitzchak is getting older, Baba Yamim, and it's time to bless his two sons. Now, you know, blessings by the matriarchs and patriarchs is not like, oh, Baruch Hashem, thank God you're married, get out of my life. Blessings were the future, defining their future, defining who and what they would be. So Rivka overhears Yitzhak telling Esau, it's time for me to give the blessings. Go hunt, bring me a meal, we'll eat, and then we'll get the blessings. She quickly calls Yaakov, put on your brother's clothes. Go to dad. Go get the blessing. Esau cannot get the blessing because of who he is. So Yaakov doesn't want to do it because like, I don't want to deceive dad. Rivka says, no, the sin, the deceit will be on my head. I'm telling you what to do as your mother, go do it. And he does it. Yitzchak, he walks in, the famous story. He's wearing the clothes of Esav. Kyle called Yaakov. The voice is the voice of Yaakov. He's wearing the furs of Esau, his father says. Your voice sounds like Jacob, but yet when I touch you, you have the hands of Esau because he's wearing the furs. And Yitzchak blesses Yaakov with the blessing that Esau was supposed to get. Now he gets the blessing and Esau comes back with the food, walks into the room and says, Dad, I'm here. I'm ready for my blessing. And Yitzchak begins to tremble. And Yesa begins to cry because he says, I gave the blessing to your brother. And Esau is crying. He's bawling like a baby. Have you no blessing for me, father? You gave away my blessing to Jacob. Have you no blessing for me? He's devastated. Think of the psychological impact that's going on. His father's trembling. He's crying like a baby. 
And then Yaakov gives him a different blessing, which I'm going to read in a minute. This is the end of this little story. And there's so many questions here. There's so many questions. Question number one, and I'm going to, I'm going to try to go really fast because it's already 1101. Question number one, if you're having a disagreement with your husband, your husband wants to leave his entire company to the younger son. Esau is not shy to run my corporation. I'm going to give it to the younger son. He's going to run my corporation. Wife says, I mean, no, I'm going to give it to my older son, not to my younger son. The wife says, honey, I don't know if you know, but Esau is very frivolous with money. You gave him a million dollars last year to invest in a stock. He lost it. He's irresponsible. He uses the money for drugs and alcohol. He can't be the owner of your company. You have to give it to the younger son who's responsible. He has an MBA from Harvard. He's the one to give the, the, the company to. You have a discussion with your husband. What's with the deception? Rivka and Yitzhak, we discussed, had one of the most beautiful marriages last week. Cohesive, loving, kind. And remember, Rivka is the girl who's... 60 times went to bring barrels of water for the camels. Remember last week mm -hmm. we discussed how she yep. brought 60 barrels for the camels, not one barrel. She had a good a walk. She was the kindest of kind. How could she deceive her husband? She's the kindest woman in the universe. How could she do that? But th these are very powerful questions. And God could have doctored up the story and not make her look bad. To say, you know, the blessing was given to Yaakov. Why does God tell us the whole story? How Rivka deceives her husband with her son. And then when Esau comes back, he's ready to kill Yaakov. And Yaakov now gets another blessing from Yitzchak. Another blessing. The blessing of the patriarch. And he escapes to Mesopotamia where he meets his future wives, which we'll discuss next week. So first of all, Yitzhak is not angry at the end of the Torah portion. He doesn't say to Yaakov, yeah, you're running away now. Good for you. Look what you did. He says, come here, my son. You have to leave, but let me bless you. And he blesses him. So Yitzhak knew that Yaakov had to get the bracha. So there's a whole mystical story here that's not so clear from the book. When you read the Pasuk, it sounds like pretty bad. <laughs> Anybody want to share something before we go into something? And I'm going to condense it because it's, it's a, it, it requires a lot of explanation, but I'm going to put it in, in a few words. Anybody want to say, what do you think happened here? Scandalous. It's not so scandalous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Margaret, do you remember? No, I'm just wondering. Okay, so after he gives... Esau's blessing to, to Itzhak. To Jacob. To Jacob. He gives another blessing to Esau, right? He gives him a different blessing, yes. Right. He gives him a blessing that he will be, uh, like, he'll be wealthy and he'll, uh, he'll have, the, you yeah. know. He'll be, yeah. yeah. It's not that Esau doesn't get a blessing. He doesn't get the blessing. Okay, first of all, he doesn't get the blessing because in a nutshell, what had to happen here was that Esau would get the blessing of the firstborn. And remember I said the conqueror. He was going to be the king of the Jewish people, a leader, a conqueror, the Jewish people, like a King David type. Mm -hmm. And Jacob was going to be the rabbi, the rabbi, the scholar. You go to him for counseling. You go to him with questions at halacha, the spiritual leader of the Jewish people. It was going to be a partnership. You need a king and you need a spiritual leader. The spiritual leader doesn't even know how to wield the sword in a sense. Like most Jewish men don't know how to use a screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> you know how to use a screwdriver. You know how to hunt, right? You know? Uh, Jewish people by nature were not trained to be warriors. But now, when Rivka sees that the partnership is non-existent, Esau intermarries with idolaters. He's, a, he's promiscuous. He kidnaps women from other men and he abuses them. And he's uh, himself an adult, uh, you know, an idolater. He can't be the king of Israel. It's, it's, it's here. So it's, it's a tremendously uh, catastrophic situation. She has to save it. So now Yaakov, who is the innocent, quiet scholar, has to become the conqueror and the scholar. 
the conqueror and the cultivator, the spiritual leader and the king. He, she tells him, you now have to assume both identities. Whether you like it or not, you have to become the CEO and the COO. The creative thinker and also the practical guy who manages the budget of the company. So that's, first of all, what's happening here. But why the deceit? Ah, now I'll explain why the deceit. Remember that whatever happens today with Rivka and Yitzchak and the sons is something that happens eternally. It's not only that he put on the fur coat of his brother, he got the blessings, he runs away, and life goes on. Everything the matriarchs and patriarchs do impacts us today. You and I are able to walk down the street and worship a miracle because of their miracles. The Jews who walked into the gas chamber screaming, Ani ma'amin b'amuna shalem b'avis ha-Mashiach. I believe in God till the coming of Mashiach. Because there was an Avram and a Sarah who were willing to give up their son on the altar. <clears throat> That's where the energy and sparks come from, the matriarchs and the patriarchs. So now let's see what happens quickly. I know, uh, and, and, and please don't feel if you have to go, I, I don't want to feel like I'm keeping you, but this is such a, a wonderful point that I, I would love to share with you. So now, remember, Yaakov goes into his father. He's wearing Esau's clothes, right? The fur coat from Albi furs, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he walks into the chamber and Yitzhak says to his son, come closer to me and kiss me. Because remember, he was blind. Mm -hmm. And Yitzhak and Yaakov comes closer and he kisses him. And Vayerech Azureyach Bidbadbal. He smells the scent of his clothes. Isaac smells the scent of Jacob's clothes, his furs, right? He's wearing the fancy furs that Esau wore whenever he came to visit his parents, okay? And he smells the fragrance of his clothes. You know, furs have a distinctive smell. And he blessed him. And he says to him, Re'ei re'ach v'ni, Behold, the fragrance of my son is like the fragrance of a field which the Lord has blessed. So he smells the fragrance of the furs. Now let me tell you, furs don't have the greatest smell. I don't know who has a fur coat here. Fr furs don't have the greatest smell. Am I right, Jane? I don't know. <laughs> okay, but you know, I have some, a funny story to tell you, but there's no time about furs. Yes. I wore my mother's fur once. She gave it to me to wear at an event. She says, every girl needs a fur coat. You know, the Russians, they're very much into fur coats because you don't feel the cold. But anyway, so the question is, really? The smell of a, frag of a fur coat is like the field which God has blessed? Not roses, not lilies, not tulips, not Christian Dior perfume? Furs smell like the God's field? So the Talmud jumps in, the Talmud Gemara says, and he smelled the fragrance of his garments. But don't read the word, the God of garments, read it like the word traitor. Same word that means garments also means traitors. Like traitors, you know, Benedict Arnold, world known traitor. So now the plot thickens and I'm going to finish the point. This is the answer to the whole question. When Yaakov, Jacob, goes to get the blessing from Isaac and his father smells the furs, he says, ah, this is the smell of the traitors. Let me bless you like the Lord's fields are blessed. Yitzchak saw the traitors of Israel, the traitors of the Jewish people. And he said, let me bless you because of those like, what I see in the future, the traitors of Israel. What does this mean? One quick story, and then you'll understand. When Yitzhak saw in the future that the descendants of Jacob, which means you and I, the future generations of Jews, would stray away from the path of righteousness of godliness. But at the last final moment, they would repent and reconnect to God. 
when he saw that future of the Jewish people, he said, this is like the aroma of God's fields, which are blessed. In other words, what Yitzhak was telling Yaakov, who had to wear the clothes of Esau, is that there will be a time in the future that Jews will not look like Jacob. They'll look like Esau. Jews will live in America, in Europe, in Russia, in Germany, and we will assimilate. We will look like the typical German. We will look like the typical American. We will look like the typical European. We will adapt their traditions. We'll give up on our Judaism. We'll even deny our Judaism. We'll say, I'm not really Jewish. Maybe my Baba was Jewish, but maybe I'm not Jewish anymore. I'm a German. I'm aristocrat. I'm a Roman. I'm a Greek. I'm an American. Jews in the future generations will look like Esau. Rivka knew that there'll be a time when the Jewish people will assimilate into the universe, into the world, and they'll look like Esau. She had to protect future generations. She had to make sure that now they may look like a Jacob. But then one day they will look like an Esau. And that Esau, that future generation, we will need to have a blessing that will keep us Jewish, will keep us connected to godliness and holiness and allow us sometimes even in our final moments of our lives to reconnect to who we are. When Yitzhak saw, that's why Rivka dresses up Yaakov in Asaph's clothes. It had to be acted out. It had to create an energy now for future generations. A Jacob dressed like an Esau. A Jacob, a Jew disguised as an American. Wearing the same clothing, the same ripped jeans with the holes in the knees. And the t-shirt that says, I'm an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe in God anymore. That will allow a Jew to never, 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 never lose their connection. Because the Jacob was dressed like an Esau. And that created a future where a Jew could come back. Because no matter how much you want to disguise yourself like an Esau, I'm not even Jewish. I don't believe what my Baba said. I don't believe what my grandpa said. You'll always be a Jacob. Because it is the Jacob dressed like an Esau who got that blessing. Mm-hmm. And explain the quick story of Franz Rosenzweig. Anybody remember him? He wrote the Star of Redemption. This is what the, this is what it's talking about. I want to share with you the story, so you know what I'm talking about. Who are the betrayers? The traitors? God's uh, that uh, Yitzhak saw. So you remember Franz Rosenzweig? He lived in ni- he died in 1929. He was a theologian, a philosopher in Germany, and he wrote the book, The Star of Redemption. What happened to him? When he was 27 years old in 1913, he was friends with Rudolf Ehrenberg, who convinced him to convert to Christianity. Now, Franz Rosenzweig didn't grow up with Judaism. He was an assimilated Jew. He didn't even know really about anything. So when he got embraced by the Christians, he said, yeah, why not? And they scheduled the day for his baptism. Fine. Now, what did he say? He said to himself, I never experienced Judaism. Yom Kippur is coming. I'll go to Shul in Berlin. I'll do my last Jewish act. And then when I convert to Christianity, it's with a pure heart. Right? Okay. It's Yom Kippur. He goes to Berlin. He doesn't go to the biggest Shul in Berlin. He finds a shtibble on one corner in Berlin. He goes in. Yom Kippur night. And he spends 24 hours in the shtibble. It's his last act of Judaism. It's his last Jewish act, right? Give it all you got. 24 hours later, he comes out of the shtibble. He breaks his fast. He calls up Rudolf Ehrenberg. He says, tomorrow, cancel the baptism. I decided I want to remain Jewish. What happened? He writes it in the Stars of Redemption. What happened is this. He was a Jew who didn't know what a Jew is. He was an Esau, dressed in the furs of his father, of of his hunter. And suddenly, for the first time in his life, the first and only, first, not the only, because he becomes more involved. He, first time in his life, 
in a shtibel in Berlin, he experienced godliness, holiness. And once he experienced godliness in its purest form on Yom Kippur, he said to himself, I am a Jew. I am not a Christian. So when Yitzhak looked at Jacob dressed like an Esau, he smelled the clothes, he smelled the traitors, he smelled people like Franz Rosenzweig, who at one point in their lives would experience, would be traitors, ready to baptize, but would finally at their last moment experience Judaism, experience spirituality, godliness, holiness. And that was like the blessed field of Almighty God. That's what it was. So Rivka and Yitzchak were not only giving a blessing to Yaakov dressed like an Esau, they were giving a blessing to every Yaakov for all generations who would consider themselves Esau's, but would have the ability to become, at one point, be a traitor, but then return to God, to holiness. This is the story of the blessings. This is the true story of the blessings. It's brilliant. <laughs> based on Hasidus. This is all based on Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah Hasidus. It's not my own. I can't take credit for it. <laughs> so this is really the story of ja ja Yaakov and Esau. And by the way, just a little side note. Yaakov suffers the consequences. Don't think all good deeds don't go unpunished. <laughs> Because he did deceive his father, he gets deceived later. So he suffers the consequence. This was self-sacrifice for him too, by the way. It was not like, oh yeah, I'm just going to deceive my father. When you're a person like a Yaakov, you suffer the ramifications of anything you do, even if you do it for the greater good. Yeah. Even if you do it for the greater good. So sometimes self-sacrifice is to your own detriment, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about next time. So to sum it up, is the energy we have to reconnect to God, to our souls, to who we are, comes from generations ago when a Yaakov dressed like his brother Esau went and got the blessing. That gives us our energy and our sparks today. That's the real story of Jewish survival. This is the miracle of Jewish survival. This is the story. This is why we are here today. Because Jacob wore Esau's clothes. It created an energy that could never go away. That you and I, no matter how far we fall into that valley and disown who we are and say, I'm not Jewish, I'll never be Jewish, I can't be Jewish, da, 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 da. There will be a point where you will jump back and reconnect because you're always going to be a Jacob, no matter what you do. That is our story. That is our story. So tomorrow night, tomorrow, 18 minutes before sunset. What do I always say? Light Shabbos candles. <laughs> Light Shabbos.